Hello, this is Cece Kim. This is Jim Bacho. This is another episode of Movies About Music. That's right. We called another Audible this week.、Mm-hmm. We were going to do Spinal Tap, and actually, we did. We recorded、yes. a full episode, a、right. podcast episode on Spinal Tap.、Mm-hmm. And I was listening back, and you actually came to me and you said, you know what? That might have not been good. Well, yeah, because I was in a really grumpy mood. I was, it turned out that I was sick. You know, it was like just before I got sick. And so I was just not having it. Well, we had this, and I don't think we're ever going to do this again, but we had this Korean meal where you eat this raw, still living、um, seafood. So we had like just oysters and abalone and clams and all that stuff. The, the abalone was kind of grilled alive,、mm-hmm. it was like kind of moving, right? It was very Trying disturbing. Trying to get off the grill, yeah. Yeah, it was very disturbing. And we kind of we were in one of those situations where somebody was treating us, and that somebody was like older than us. And you know, we were trying to be like that Korean kind of polite where you know、mm-hmm. you don't say no to anything and you kind of have to eat everything that that、yeah. person is. I've been in that situation many, many times. And then I ended up with food poisoning. Yeah, I felt wrong like、mm-hmm. for a couple days.、Yeah. I was having. I don't want to go into details. Right. But it seemed to hit you particularly bad. Oh, yeah. And、I、you、did. were bad for a few days. Yeah. So, and then we tried to do a, a podcast of Spinal Tap. We watched the movie, we enjoyed it.、Mm-hmm. But then I also realized that, you know, my sort of my non facts kind of approach to doing this podcast, I want to,、mm-hmm. as I've said many times, I want to go into the film as a film. I don't want、mm-hmm. to explain,、mm-hmm. you know, factually too much what. Things are just, can,、yes. just to talk about what's, what the lives of the people are in the movie. But I realized with Spinal Tap, I shouldn't have done that. Like, well, also, I really needed my information. I feel like I never, I just want to go on the record to say that I never thought that that was a good idea to not do it. I know. Do I still、yeah. think it's a good idea, but I am going to, I still feel that way, but I am going to、um, make more of an effort to at least know the things that I'm talking about. Okay. And so is that why you did some research about the movie that we just saw? I did a little、saw. research for、okay. the movie that we just、good. saw. Okay. Good. Okay. So, what movie did we see? A Star is Born, but the 1970, what version? What was it? 1978. So there's.、Mm-hmm. Here's evidence of my research that、mm-hmm. I've done. Okay. Mr. Fax. My dad used to say Fax Factus.、Mm-hmm. <laughs> so my name is Fax, Fax Factus. Okay. Right now. There have been kind of four versions of this. There was a 1937 Janet Gaynor,、mm-hmm. Frederick March version, which is not really the same story. Right. 1954, there was a musical with Judy Garland and James Mason, and that's kind of the golden age of、yes. musicals. We haven't seen that, have you? I have not seen that. I haven't seen it. But I've seen bits and pieces of it because I love Judy Garland. Yeah. Yeah. So we're, we're going to try to see that、mm-hmm. for another podcast.、Mm-hmm. Um, and then, did I say 78? It's 76. Okay. Yeah. 76. And this is with Barbara Streisand and Chris Christopherson. Of course, more recently, there's been the Lady Gaga and Bradley Cooper、yes. film that came out in 2018、mm-hmm. that was nominated for a bunch of Academy Awards.、Mm. I didn't see that one either. So I've seen none of these four movies.、Mm. I should amend that to say maybe I saw the 1967 version because I definitely remember it, even though I was seven years old. You mean the 1976 What did I say? 67. Oh, yeah, yeah. That would be. You weren't born yet. No, I was, that、yeah. was prior to even like insemination. Right. <laughs> yes. So there wasn't even any、right. seed of me. Exactly. Yeah. You know, when I was seven years old, my parents used to drag me out to see these movies because、mm-hmm. they wanted to go. And、mm-hmm. I don't even remember my sisters ever going. But、mm-hmm. I, for some reason, I was always going to the movie. Maybe, well, I, maybe I wanted to go. Yeah. And you, you know, Needed a babysitter and they probably yeah, that, find yeah, one. That's yeah, that's bingo. They didn't want to <laughs> pay for a babysitter,、mm-hmm. probably, or they didn't want to get a babysitter.、Mm-hmm. Or maybe I wanted to go. I don't know. But I saw a lot of movies with my parents as like,、cool. you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten、mm-hmm. year old kid.、Um, some very questionable movies. Right. Anyway, I, I may have seen this movie because、mm-hmm. it, it, there, it seems to have an, an imprint on me. I think at the time the movie came out, regardless of whether or not I've seen it, you know, Barbara Streisand was a big star.、Mm. And You know, kind of an emerging star, I think, at that point.、Mm. And she kind of falls into this Cher, Bette Midler,、mm, okay. this kind of actor,、um, singer. singer. I, I think she was maybe one of the first who did this kind of thing. And it's, it was basically a star vehicle for her. Yeah, clearly.、Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, her, her name is all over the credits.、She's... It, no, it was a Barbara Streisand music video, like, it was a concert. <laughs> 
I felt like, yeah. yeah. This film is also notable, and I think this is why we're watching this, mm. for the screenplay was penned. Now, it's a very complicated kind of story of how yes. this film came about. One of the drafts of the screenplay, mm -hmm. one of the main drafts, was by Joan Didion and John Dunn. Mm -hmm. And they worked on it as a musical about a husband and wife musical partnership, kind of inspired by James Taylor and Carly Simon, mm -hmm. who at the time, you know, were big, you know, singer-songwriters. Mm -hmm. According to the director, they were parallel and competing. They had parallel and competing careers. Mm, okay. Anyway, I think that was the inspiration. I think that they called it A Star is Born without knowing about the previous ones. I'm not sure about that. Okay. The movie was brought to Barbara Streisand as a star vehicle for her and to fulfill a studio commitment, apparently. Mm. So it was one of those kind of studio deals. And Didion and Dunn, they left the script writing process after the third draft. Okay. It's not clear why, as far as I could tell. Here's where things get weird. Mm -hmm. Barbara Streisand's partner, mm -hmm. this guy named John, I don't know his last name. He was a hairdresser for Hollywood. Okay. And they were romantic partners. Mm -hmm. And then they, you know, they hired the director, Frank Pearson, mm -hmm. who was best known as a screenwriter. Mm -hmm. So he reworked the script. Okay. He was offered the film. He did a lot of successful Hollywood films mm -hmm. as, as a scriptwriter. He didn't do much directing, I don't think. So they, the two of them left the script, and it was left to the director to pick it up. Mm -hmm. And this guy, John, mm -hmm. Barbara Streisand's partner, got involved, and it just became a mess. Okay. And the whole thing became a disaster. Okay. This movie is not a very well-reviewed movie. So wait, just for clear sure. uh, clarification, Barbara Streisand's partner, John something, the hairdresser, he was involved in what capacity? Was he involved in the script, script writing? So there's a whole scandalous thing where the director of the film, after the film came out, it got really bad reviews. Mm -hmm. And the director penned this essay mm -hmm. and published it in, I don't know, Village Voice or something like that. Right. Just explaining why the movie was a disaster. Okay. And really shitting on Barbara Streisand and this guy, John, <laughs> because they were meddling with the filmmaking process and, and trying oh, to control I things. See. So it was kind of like a couple, a Hollywood right. couple coming into the movie and trying to hijack things to make Barbara Streisand kind of look good. Oh, okay. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I love Barbara Streisand, but that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. But to go back to Joan Didion, I mean, you know, I kept thinking while we were watching the movie, you know, there's some good moments. There's some really good moments. And I kept thinking, oh, that's probably Joan Didion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it, it mm -hmm. may not be true. You know, you never right. know because the way these scripts go through these cycles. Well, I haven't read any fiction that she has written. You're a big Joan Didion yeah. fan. Yeah, I mean, I've read um, a lot of her essays. I was severely traumatized last year. I read A Year of Magical Thinking, which is a book about grief, mm -hmm. during my quarantine. Yeah. Yeah, and that really effed me up. Um, and then I read Blue Nights, which is another book about grief, not too long afterwards. What do you like about her writing? Um, she recently passed away. When yes, did she die? that's why. Uh, like a few weeks ago, right? Yeah, I think yeah. maybe a month ago. Or yeah, something. about a month ago. Yeah. yeah. She, I think, has a way of putting things to light, things that are universal to everybody, mm. like feelings, just, you know, life in general. Mm-hmm. And she has a way of illuminating them in, in, in a way that really resonates with a, a lot of people, I think. And it's actually, she's not terribly emotional, you know. Her writing is, if anything, it, it's sometimes it's a little dry. There's a matter-of-factness about the way she um, expresses things. I just really like her writing. It just, her writing sort of, it doesn't pierce you like a knife, but it kind of just it sits there until it becomes a dull ache. Interesting. Mm. Sounds like a writer you can kind of dwell with. And Yeah. She's had an extraordinary life, but she makes it sound so normal. Like she, she wrote an entire book about grief after her husband died mm -hmm. and the process of that grief mm -hmm. and what goes through your mind, like from the beginning, mm -hmm. like for an entire year. Mm -hmm. And that's the magical year of thinking. The, I see. The yes, year yes, after yes. her husband died. Okay. Yeah. That's something that I would like to read about because it kind of... It, it happens to a lot of us, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We outlive our <laughs> husbands, a lot of us outlive. Yeah, yeah. And I've been sort of obsessed with this for the past year or so. Because <laughs> you're older than me. Right. On average, women tend to live longer anyway. So I, I've been just incredibly consumed by the thought of living like a couple of decades without you. So it was like, I think her way of living... Just moving on and continuing to live mm -hmm, was mm -hmm. writing. So right. it was like a very ritualistic thing for her. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a movie about 
mm-hmm. living on. Mm-hmm. I guess we can go ahead and spoil that. Yeah, right? well, very much so, I think. Yeah. Because I have some things to say about that ending scene and why that ending scene was the way it was. <laughs> well, I want to get to that right, right. and I want to get to the last perform, the final performance. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But let's maybe ramp it up a little bit. Mm-hmm. I, d- I think everybody's familiar probably with the plot. Right. I kind of want to get into what you thought of the dynamic between Barbara Streisand and Chris Christopherson. So mm. we didn't really talk about Chris Christopherson. We right. talked about Barbara Streisand. So who play. is he? Well, where do I know him from? Yeah. So yeah. Chris Christopherson was quite big in the 70s. Mm-hmm. He's one of these guys. He's like one of these just romantic characters. Mm-hmm. Roman- he's a man's man. Okay. As we used to say. Mm-hmm. You know, singer, songwriter. I think he graduated with some high honors from col- from a great from an Ivory League college or something like that. Mm-hmm. Here again, I'm not getting I'm going from memory here. But I think he was highly educated. Mm-hmm. But he wrote these blue collar country tunes, mm-hmm. kind of folk country tunes. He's not the greatest singer in the world, mm-hmm. but he's a great songwriter. Okay. And he wrote like me and Bobby McGee which Janis Joplin made famous. Mm-hmm. And he's written a lot of songs. He, he worked with Willie Nelson and Johnny Cash, I think. But yeah, he's a very highly respected okay. musician and yeah. singer and yeah. songwriter, mostly a songwriter. Mm-hmm. But he's also been an actor, like he was in the Blade movies with Wesley Snipes. Really? So he's a legit actor mm-hmm. also. He moved from music into acting. Yeah. So he and Barbara Streisand, I guess, have that in common. I don't mm-hmm. know how much how many movies she really did. I think she did Funny Girl, Barbara Streisand. Oh, she did a lot of movies. Yeah, I think she Great did. Great movies. I think she did. Yeah. A Mirror Has Two Faces. Mm, okay. um, she did... Well, I heard for this movie, she wanted to get Marlon Brando. What? Yeah. Who I don't think I want to ever hear sing. Yeah. <laughs> and he was kind of like a little older by then, wasn't he? Like, Well, he that's was... what I was thinking yeah. when I was reading about this. I was thinking Brando at, well, seven, yeah, Brando so 76, was... I'm thinking Brando in Apocalypse Now. Last Tango in Paris, Brando. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You're right. That, that's old. Yeah. It's it's old, yeah. But, but it wasn't like objectively old. He mm-hmm. wasn't like objectively old, but he objectively old. <laughs> no, but like Marlon Brando like Yeah, uh, yeah. Marlon Brando did not age well. Like no, he, he, didn't. he really grew like he really He's grew pretty old slimy into, in Last Tango in Paris. Oh my too. god, he was so slimy. This yeah. it traumatized the hell out of me that movie. Well, it traumatizes the main actress. The main yeah. actress too, yeah. I mean, he was a gorgeous man. He was, yeah, he was the best looking man. He was the best looking man yeah. who had ever lived. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're right. What's the one streetcar named Desire? Have mm-hmm. you seen that? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. He's amazing in that yeah, movie. Yeah, yeah. So that would have been interesting. But no, Chris Christopherson, he's, you know, I think early on in the movie we were mm-hmm. like, what what is this? Like <laughs> his music was not good. Yeah. I had a hard time buying that he was a rock star of that caliber. Yeah. Because his singing was not very engaging in a way that he rock doesn't stars have that usually, voice. Yeah. yeah. He you would need somebody who's got that it yeah. in their voice yeah. and he doesn't have it. Right. Like I've got some Chris Christopherson albums and I listen to him and I like him, but not a huge fan of his voice. Yeah, yeah, he doesn't have that voice. He doesn't have the the kind of presence in his voice, in his singing, that would command a crowd like that. And I was wondering what you thought about his voice, actually, just, just through this movie. Like, his voice, it's not that he's singing off-key, I don't think. Obviously not, yeah. It's but, just... But it's, it's, the way he moves through melodies is very strange. It's a little robotic. Mm-hmm. It's There's a metallic and grainy quality to his voice that is not, like that engaging Mm -hmm. it's not he kind of sounds like he's been singing in a lot of bars exactly so he's kind of like the tom waits before there was Mm -hmm. tom waits that's how i would think of chris christopherson yeah and usually those kind of artists they don't end up singing in those kind of stadiums they do exactly yeah yeah so that's it i had a hard time believing that he was a star of that level i agree this is 76 this is one of the early versions of that kind of dangerous rock and roll dude Mm, okay don't you think i mean because i don't think there was a lot of movies before this one Mm -hmm. there was janice joplin there was Jimi hendrix there was Mm -hmm. jim morris and they had already come and gone no but maybe what you're saying maybe not depicted in in a film depicted in a film yeah Yeah. exactly i think it maybe in real life there were probably a lot of um that kind of behavior yeah so we get to see kind of Mm -hmm. this behind the scenes Mm -hmm. of a debaucherous yes singer and he's not a bad guy right he's just a drunk and he just doesn't 
just doesn't want to work. I think. Yeah. Like a lot of musicians I know. Yeah. <laughs> they... He's very. I, I found him very convincing. Yeah, very, me too. very yeah. realistic yeah. kind of character. Mm-hmm. As a character, yes. The singing, yeah. no. But as right. a character, yes. Like they don't want to be a vehicle. Like they don't want to be like a dancing monkey to make money. Yeah. You right. know. And I totally got that from his character. Like he doesn't want to. You know, he's essentially like a singing guitar playing man who mm-hmm. doesn't want to listen to anybody. Yeah. You know, he just right. wants to do what he does. Yeah. And you I, can't get, you can't control somebody like that. That's exactly. the whole That's problem the with you, this business. Yeah. You can't, yeah. you can't get, you know, a, a musician to do something other than what they're going to do. They're like cats. Musicians are like cats. Totally. And those things are totally mutually exclusive. And what they don't understand is like, you know, a lot of business people, I hear a lot of people say things like, if only he would just be on time, then he would be like, you know, perfect. And I'm just like, no, he, if he were on time, he wouldn't be as he, good. Yeah. As There's he, some, there yeah. is something weird about that. Yeah. And I don't want to use the G word, but, mm-hmm. but there is something to these personalities. I mean, obviously there's not everybody, not every great musician mm-hmm. has that characteristic, but there is something about that characteristic mm-hmm. that has a bit of greatness to them. Well, yeah. I think because they obsess about totally. their craft and, and they kind of close out the world. Of, obviously. I mean, I think it's like pretty obvious. And like, for some reasons, agents and producers don't seem to understand this very basic thing. Mm-hmm. And they just get so frustrated. that It's like, what do you expect? I'm like, in order to play music at that level in order to continue to write great songs you give up something major and along the way you give up more and more things like being on time like not being sober you know <laughs> like being yeah. sober and uh, having a family whatever mm-hmm. you know being monogamous mm-hmm. and right. that's the price and i'm yeah. sorry but you know you can't have both true yeah you yeah. can't you can't have the artist you know and the mm. punctual you know yeah whatever yeah it just doesn't doesn't happen. Yeah, hire a banker, you know, whatever, yeah. the, to, to, to sing your songs then. like You know who's an exception to this? Do you know who Robert Fripp is? No. That guy is disciplined like freaking crazy. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, there are those who are, yeah, right. but usually... Like prog rock guys yeah. are these disciplined... Yeah, like our friend, our friend, like Zach Barden, <laughs> is okay. great, you know, is a great musician, uh-huh. and he's very, very disciplined. <laughs> Very punctual, right, right? You know. Well, that's the other side yeah. of it. That's the obsessive, I think. Yeah, totally. I mean, yeah. there's different forms of obsessive personalities mm-hmm. in musicians. I think. Movies about music. And then there's Barbara Streisand. Mm-hmm. Oh my God, what a voice! Oh my God, perfection. Yeah, absolute perfection. Just the entire, the whole time, I was just like, there, there is not a single breath in there that was wrong. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, you made an interesting comparison. Yeah, I said her and Aretha Franklin and are at just first, perfect. Yeah, and at yeah. first I went, uh, and then I went, oh, okay, I actually see what you're talking about. Yeah, and I only say that for one reason. I'm not, com- stylistically, obviously, they're very different. Um, they're very different singers. But Aretha Franklin and Barbara Streisand both have a natural voix mixte. What what voix mixte is, is the, the passaggio is like naturally aligned which means that they don't have a flip between their chest voice and their head voice. Mm-hmm. Most people, you can hear, you know, like a falsetto yeah. sounds like a falsetto. Shift into a falsetto, yeah. yeah. So a chest where like a, you know, you belt and then it mm-hmm. shifts into a chest, uh, the head voice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They, those two naturally do not have that shift. Mm. Michael Jackson is also another oh, person okay. who does not have that shift. Mm. It's genius. You yeah. have to be born with it. I think like you can kind of train to, I mean, you know, I'm still in the process of training, mm-hmm. but you could still, most people, even like the best singers, especially if you have a heavy chest voice, even if you really develop your head voice, there's still going to be a difference in texture. Mm. They're not always like, it's not like completely aligned. Like Bruno Mars is like really good. Like his head voice is really good and clear, Mm -hmm. but you could still hear the difference between his chest Mm -hmm. and head voice. Mm -hmm. Michael Jackson doesn't have that. Mm -hmm. It's just completely aligned. Mm. And Barbara Streisand and Aretha Franklin are just, they can just sing anything. Yeah. And it's just, there's a power and control that is just like unparalleled. Mm -hmm. With those two. Right. And this movie felt like a Barbara Streisand demo. <laughs> well, apparently it was. It's the studio said, I mean, the studio said, let's, we want to make this movie. Mm-hmm. We don't even really care about the quality. Oh we just gosh. need to get six songs. 
Yeah, it was from a, Barbara Streisand. It was a Barbara Streisand sample. <laughs> yeah. So apparently, this is part of the thing that got her in a lot of trouble. Because nobody with the likes shit like that. <laughs> well, I, I guess it's the ultimate diva movie, isn't it? Yeah, nobody likes that. It's yeah. so it's corny. <laughs> right. That being said, did you think that this movie was a disaster? There was a lot of problems with this movie. Mm -hmm. um, it's got 38% approval on Rotten Tomatoes, I think. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's that bad. I don't think it was that bad either. It's got some cringe moments. Right. I mean, there's there's some things that don't age well, like Barbara mm -hmm. Streisand's first band before she meets John. Right. So she is Esther and he is John. Mm -hmm. So Esther's band is called the Oreos. Right. Yeah, I know. It was weird. And, yeah. and it's... She's singing between two black women. Uh -huh. That was bad. That was really bad. But that's, you know, that's another yeah. era. That's 1976. The things that I thought were bad was the sound mm. engineering was dreadful. Mm, yeah, it was. Yeah. I couldn't hear the dialogue. Yeah, me neither. I, I think what happened with this movie is, you know, in the 1970s, there was obviously a lot of cocaine going around. I don't want to attribute that to this, but I think there was somewhere along the way, there was a loss of care that went into this movie. I think at the editing stage, it was like... Well, let's just edit this and get it done mm -hmm. and get it out because there was some bad editing. There was some really bad mixing. You know, you couldn't hear the voices at times. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they were trying to do a Robert Altman thing, but while people were singing, there was talking going on. Right, right. And it just wasn't very, you know, it wasn't that moment. Mm -hmm. I, you know, there's this moment in the bar when he first hears her sing. Mm -hmm. We don't really get a golden moment like the golden moment we got in Hustle and Flow, for example, mm -hmm. where every time stands still mm -hmm. as Terrence Howard is listening to this woman mm -hmm. sing. We don't get that. It's very kind of, again, I think it's this Robert Altman influence of kind of overlapping things going on. Mm -hmm. But also some of the shots were like, it wasn't a very well shot film, I didn't mm -hmm. think. There's some very cheesy lines. Oh, very cheesy lines. Yeah. There's like, there's love scenes of them falling in love and it was convincing. You know, mm -hmm. you get these scenes, like they're in the bubble bath and things mm -hmm. like that. And they're good, mm -hmm. but they're slightly awkward. Yeah, we were laughing hysterically at certain parts when it wasn't supposed to be funny. Like there was a cutaway from something to well, them riding on horses. <laughs> They were fighting. It was the kind of fighting that led to love making, and then all of a sudden, because she, he had another woman yeah. in their bed. <laughs> I'm like, okay, this is the 70s. Yeah, and she was angry, and then he somehow turned this around and like made it her fault. <laughs> it <was> really weird. <laughs> Not exactly. I know, but, but, but yeah, kind of felt like he was, you know. Well, this is who he is. He's <laughs> yeah, like, he's like, he's like, it. this is who I am. Yeah, I totally get it. Yeah. yeah. It's like, oh, I'm not good for you kind of thing. Right. I thought he handled that that, that moment, though, really. What Both of them had really good moments of acting uh -huh. and, and they felt very genuine. Yeah. They had great chemistry. The ending didn't yeah. work. The, the, um, so shocker, he, he's an alcoholic. He dies at the end. It's kind of a and suicide. Yeah, I think it's a suicide. Yeah. 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 And I think that's how it was treated in the press that I was reading. Mm -hmm. It's a suicide. He kind of says goodbye to her. Yep. And then he drives off. I don't know how you felt about that death, but I it was weird because... <laughs> it's really weird. Well, he's he's playing her music in the uh -huh. car on an 8-track. Oh, mm -hmm. God, the 8-track. I remember the 8-track. The song ends and he's going over this horizon. He's driving crazy ass fast. Mm -hmm. And then we cut away to this crane shot kind of mm -hmm. pulling back to reveal the car mm -hmm. accident there's no music playing right it's just dry sound yeah and then she shows up and i don't know i, I don't know how to feel about it because it was almost like oh here's the obligatory he's dead yeah i don't know how you felt about it it was weird maybe, it was really weird okay. i'm thinking maybe i'm wrong like maybe there's a you know it's not overly dramatic but then I think it needs to have some drama to but it. But then, like, it, the whole movie was overly dramatic, but then that scene was, was really, kind of dry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, almost like a documentary kind of thing. Yeah. But, was, but then, as random. the scene goes, it's, mm -hmm. it felt like in a lot of this movie, Barbara Spr Streisand, the actress, needed time to work into her emotion in the scene. Mm -hmm. And I thought that happened, like, when you're first watching it, mm -hmm. it's very dry. And then over time, she, I think she starts to improvise. I was wondering how much improvisation was going on in this movie. Then the tears start coming to her eyes. And then, then it becomes a little better. Right. I would imagine, right, that if something like that happened, there's a level of denial that takes yeah, place. Yeah, so this is what yeah. I was wondering. This is why I want to ask you what you mm -hmm. thought of it, because in a way it was really, it was, it, it was, it was good. It was pretty good. It was, I mean, it was 
accurate yeah. to to how somebody might re- respond. She's like, yeah, I thought it she's w- wiping his face. She's trying to make sure he's warm. I would think that a lot of people would react like that. There's a there's definitely a level of denial when somebody you care about dies. Yeah, 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 shock. Yeah. So the whole idea of the film is he's this big famous rock mm-hmm. star. He meets her in a club. Mm-hmm. They become romantically involved. Mm-hmm. She's singing in the club. She's I think singing it's in the club. Yeah, 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 yeah. In a sense, I guess he discovers her, but you know, it, mm-hmm. not looking for stardom for her, he just kind of falls for her. Yeah, he knows she's a good singer because he saw her sing. Mm-hmm. But then she becomes a star through him. Right. You know, this is the movie A Star Is Born. Yeah. And so through through that, she becomes a bigger star than he mm-hmm. is. And so there's a scene towards the end of the movie where he's like, I, I'm going to reinvent myself. There's never a bitterness to him. Mm. And I think this is maybe what's different from the other films. Like I think the 1954 film, like the man can't handle it, mm-hmm. that the woman becomes a star. Mm-hmm. By the 1970s, it just doesn't matter as much anymore. And they were working this into the, right. the screenplay. Right. He never re- reacts, you know, like... In a really bad way. Mm-hmm. He sort of says, okay, I'm going to resituate myself and kind of come back to my roots and, you know, mm-hmm. make these songs. And then you see him sitting on a couch playing a 12 string guitar. Mm-hmm. And I like the scene of the, the guitar slightly out of tune. Mm-hmm. It's very real. And that's where you get to hear more of what Chris Christopherson's music is actually mm-hmm. like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he's singing this song and it's nice. And he's got this nice mm-hmm. melody for a very simple chord progression. Mm-hmm. And he keeps getting interrupted by the phone and the phone is for her. Mm-hmm. Of course, he's not getting any calls himself. But then later, and this is kind of weird the way they handled it, but she hears a tape recording of this moment Mm -hmm. after he dies she turns that into a song Mm -hmm. and that becomes the final song of the film Mm -hmm. so here we are at the final song of the film Mm -hmm. and you and i were both sitting there Mm -hmm. not talking right we're watching them we're lost in the movie Mm -hmm. but we both kind of had the we talked about it afterwards Mm -hmm. we both kind of had the same reaction like there's a process to this song so this is what i was thinking (laughs) it was like a beautiful song a little bit overacted I felt like it was yeah. overly directed. Like in the beginning, it was a ballad. And I was like, wow, this is a Barbara Streisand demo in which like she belts and then she whispers and then she's like, you know, kind of crying in the middle of this one verse and then she belts again. But this time it's a little croaky because she's crying. And then all of a sudden it takes this disco turn, but like this disco gospel turn. Mm-hmm. And it does this weird Bohemian Rhapsody shit where it's like, you know, there's like a million, like, how would you describe it was a weird song. what happened? It was, so first of all, it's a weird song. Mm-hmm. There's no discernible chorus in the song. Mm-hmm. There's sort of these stages of movement yes. that are almost like exercises for her voice. Mm-hmm. It starts off really well, I think, mm-hmm. with the yeah, melody, I the Chris so Christopherson yeah. melody. Who knows who wrote the song? Maybe Barbara Streisand wrote the song. It starts off really well, and mm-hmm. it's quite emotional, and I was watching and I was transfixed. Mm -hmm. It's also a single take, which I think is important. Mm -hmm. There's no editing. Right. And it's just a it's it's a medium close up Mm -hmm. shot of her. And it goes and like you said, it transition I was thinking like it's a meatloaf song or something. You know, it becomes (laughs) this crazy, weird seventy you know, in the seventies things were weird. Everybody was doing prog rock in the seventies. Yeah. Everybody, even if it was disco, it was prog yeah. rock. Even if you're Joni Mitchell, you're doing prog rock. Everybody was yeah. experimenting was with these lot. weird arrangements. Yeah. But it's it's so strange from the music today because there's mm-hmm. no chorus to it. It just keeps going through these movements. It was a lot. And the lyrics, I was concentrating on the lyrics and mm-hmm. it's like, wait, is this him writing about her? Yeah. Or is she singing about him? How much did she rewrite of the song? It was a co- co- cocaine fueled it okay so there you go so that's a lot of what was happening in the 70s yeah. and you know i get the feeling with these bands like fleetwood mac where the cocaine doesn't make you see god it mm-hmm. makes you jam a lot of ideas into things well, it's, it's, a lot of chords and a lot that's of, how the the mayan you know civilization was built ah. like you know cocaine coca leaves mm-hmm. so yeah, it right. makes you work yeah and makes this, you work. they obviously worked on this song a lot yeah. and i was like this is a lot like <laughs> yeah it was a lot of song it was a lot of barbara streisand yeah that mo- the whole song and the whole movie was a lot of barbara streisand so here's another indication of you asked me if i thought it was a good movie mm-hmm. at the very end of the performance you know when you're doing a one take mm-hmm. when you're doing a long take you're just like oh please just don't fuck up yeah and then at the very end uh-huh. she fucked up yeah yeah not her voice but she pulled the mic away from her mm-hmm. 
and then the voice was still clear. Mm -hmm. They could have mixed that, I guess. They could have mixed that down, but they wanted the music to ring out, I mm -hmm. guess, at the very end. But she kind of screws up the last line in terms mm -hmm. of her acting performance. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what I feel about this movie, mm -hmm. is there's just these moments where it's like, lazy mm -hmm. cocaine ADD moments, you know, where they're not looking at the screen while they're editing the film or something. <laughs> oh my God, remember the dogs barking at the dog trainer? Oh yeah, that was, <laughs> that was hilarious. Yeah, there's a scene when, when the car pulls up and there's these dogs barking. <laughs> and they were supposed to be barking, barking at, at Barbara Streisand, Barbara Streisand but, but they're they were... barking off screen and you can almost out of frame imagine yeah. the dog trainer there. It was there. clearly, they were clearly barking hysterically at something mm -hmm. off screen. Screen. Yeah, but, but yeah. I had, yeah. So just technical things, and like, <laughs> why didn't you see that, and why didn't you reshoot that? Mm -hmm. I I don't know. There's apparently like stories about this movie and mm -hmm. how difficult it was to make, and how nobody was happy with it. Okay, so maybe it was hard to reshoot things. Yeah, because usually I you imagine. would go out and you would reshoot things when things don't work mm -hmm. right. But there was also a weird scene where you know they they build this house out in the middle of the desert. I think mm -hmm. it's Arizona or something. They're filming them, you know, on horses and stuff. And there's snow on the mountains. And then you hear these cars, you know, the 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 Cadillacs coming from down yeah, the road. Yeah, they pull up. Mm -hmm. And now it's oh shit! Now we got to get back to work. And then you cut, and then there's no more snow on the same <laughs> mountains. But I think time did pass. I think. I never really... Not since the Cadillacs pulled up, though. Well, so the Cadillacs pull up, and then he's talking to his manager. And it's like, you assume yeah. he got out of the car, he's talking to the manager. Yeah. But then they go inside, and Barbara Streisand is, like, trying on clothes. That's a weird sure editing continuity. Yeah. yeah. So that was a weird editing continuity thing. Anyway, just little moments like that. But I think the film did have a lot of heart. Mm -hmm. um, I know that's kind of a cliche thing to say, but I, I do think it did. I thought they had good energy together. I thought... Barbara Streisand was great. Yeah. I thought her character was really, you know, she had a nice quality to her. Yeah. You were saying she was cute. I thought she was really cute. There was a little bit of a Jennifer Aniston thing going on. Mm. Yeah. I thought she was really cute. Yeah. As a singer, I am just endlessly impressed with Barbara Streisand. But I will say, I'm not like a huge fan, mm -hmm. but obviously I respect her craft and I just hail the queen. Barbara Streisand is one of the greatest singers, you know, in recording history. Yeah. But that last scene, the one take song. The last performance. The yeah. last performance. After we watched it, I said, that song is the, is the reason why a lot of people don't like Barbara Streisand, despite the fact that she's one of the greatest. Mm -hmm. And that's why she doesn't have this sort of universal respect that like Aretha Franklin has, you know, from musicians and other singers. Mm -hmm. Because there's something inherently cheesy and self-indulgent mm -hmm. about Bar Barbara Streisand. And I think this movie had a lot to do with that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> It's think, just a lot of her. It's like yeah. a lot of singing, a lot of over singing. Yeah. Some of the songs were a, a little weird. She there were some have... weird ones, yeah. I, I think that the one mm -hmm. great moment, mm -hmm. the great performance moment was when he dragged her on stage. Oh, and she yeah. sang her first song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. And yeah. that's the big, the well-known song. I don't even know what it is. but mm -hmm. um, And the duet. I loved the duet. The duet was very cute. Mm -hmm. That was adorable. And her vocals were perfect. Yeah. Yeah, it was crazy I was, good. I was watching that and I think they that was a dub. Mm -hmm. She was she was lip syncing. Mm -hmm. But I think he was singing because that would have been really hard to reproduce. Mm -hmm. He was talk he was singing into a mic mm. to her overdubbing performance. So I think he was singing live as okay. the shot was being shot, just for that oh, one, just okay. for that one, because he starts laughing, you know, mm -hmm. and I don't, I don't think that would be in the, I don't think he would be ADRing that, you know, like trying to laugh, oh, okay. mock a laugh. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was interesting, but that was, that was a great moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I noticed from the credits, there's a lot of Barbara Streisand in the credits. <laughs> So she's music, she's music, she's she's something like music ideas mm -hmm. person. <laughs> There's a oh credit God. or something mm -hmm. like that. I don't know. I got it wrong, but um, music director, whatever. Phil Ramone apparently did mm -hmm. the recording of the music, and I think Montrose was Chris Christopherson's band, John's band. I've never been a big Montrose fan myself, but. 70s rock band, one of those 70s rock bands. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it too. It's long. It's mm -hmm. two hours and 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. I just love Chris Christopherson. I just mm -hmm. really love him as a... He's very charismatic. Yeah, he's charismatic. very charismatic. Yeah, there were some like unnecessary abs on him. 
you know, like unnecessary the, abs. So I call them unnecessary abs because if you have abs and you're not an athlete, they're unnecessary. <laughs> Yeah. Like if you don't do like hard labor, like mm-hmm. in a movie, like if, you, yeah, in the gladiator, the gladiator had to have abs, you know, if you're yeah. shooting like some Roman war movie, mm-hmm. everybody has to have abs totally. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But like he didn't have to have abs. So they're right. unnecessary. All right. Um, I'm not, it's not a value judgment. I'm just mm-hmm. saying that they're unnecessary. <laughs> Okay, I could see that. Yeah, but he, I think he was kind of a tough guy. Like he did a lot of fighting. Okay, um, yeah. but you wouldn't. But he get probably abs he doesn't like spend from, time going yeah. to the gym. Yeah. yeah. Also, he drank a lot. He was an alcoholic and, was, and stuff like that. So, well, I you know, like, sometimes alcoholics are skinny. Like they don't eat a lot. Oh, that's so true, Jim. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. You're totally right. Yeah. Sometimes they're skinny. You know what? Like true alcoholics. Yeah. I've seen a lot of really alcoholic people with abs mm-hmm. because they're really skinny. And they, they look all they malnutrition. Yeah. Malnourished. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they have visible abs because they're so skinny. Yeah. Mm. And they're also doing drugs too, usually, these skinny people. Mm. Well, he was doing cocaine. Yeah. But he wasn't like even, he wasn't skinny. Like he he literally looked like a male model kind of. He looked great. He looked great. He looked great. fantastic. Yeah. He was like, his arms had like unnecessary de- mm-hmm. definition. Yeah. 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 They had great chemistry together. I thought so too. You couldn't stop laughing at what's his name? Gus. Oh, uh, oh it, this is a very early Gary Busey. Yeah. Yeah. Gary Busey. Who's just the doofiest yeah. looking dude in the world. How did this guy become like a major <laughs> actor? But he was great. He was he was the manager, oh, yeah. constantly annoyed mm-hmm. by Chris Christopherson. Mm-hmm. There were some other cameos. There was um, Rita Coolidge and mm-hmm. um, Tony Orlando. Mm-hmm in this bizarre Grammys scene. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But yeah, it was a movie about music. It was very much a movie about music. And I think there's a lot of these movies about music. Probably. You know, with with the um, self-destructive rock star. This was kind of like a theme in the 70s and 80s, I feel like. Well, the thing that happened, Mm -hmm. you know, this is, what, five years after we lost Janis Joplin, Jimi Mm -hmm. Hendrix, Mm -hmm. and Jim Morrison. And they were all what? 27. Yeah, yeah, they were all 27 years old. Mm-hmm. And and we lost, you know, this great talent. And so it's not surprising that there would be a movie like this. Mm-hmm. And of course, it's just been, it's been going for a long time. Mm-hmm. There's so many movies. So I'm sure we're going to do some. We'll mm-hmm. try to spread them out. Mm-hmm. We're definitely going to try to hit another version of this film. Yeah, I've seen the 2018 version. Oh, okay. And I, I actually... I'm not going to say anything about it. Well, I mean, sure. I can't spoil it because it's the same plot. Yeah, but don't be too detailed because um, I don't like spoilers and okay, I don't want to know I don't want to know how he goes. I won't say anything. No, what were you going to say? But I think it's worth because it's so similar to this one, but also very different. Yeah, I mean, how like any general impressions that movie compared to this one? I think that that movie just amended all of the mistakes that this movie made. Okay. Yeah. Well, there you go. So that's 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 what happens too. Yeah. That's kind of movie making right now. It's mm-hmm. it, it's highly perfectible. Yeah, but this I think. But it lacks some of the soul. Mm, but I think the Bradley Cooper Lady Gaga one was directed by Bradley Cooper. That's right. Yeah, that I think in terms of pathos, acting, and the dramatic aspect of the film, and even the music was incredible. I felt I really liked it. I don't like the theme, but you know that doesn't matter. I don't like what this movie ended up kind of saying. Like the the questions and the okay yeah, but just from an acting and um, directing perspective, I thought it was wonderfully mm. executed. You know why I didn't see that movie? Why? Because I wanted to see this movie first. Mm, cool. Yeah. So now I've done that, and so next time we come back to this movie, mm-hmm. we'll either do the 1954 or mm-hmm. the 2018. Yeah. Maybe we'll do the 54 first. Yeah. Because Julie Garland and James Mason mm-hmm. would be great. And should we project a movie for next time? There's a couple of Korean movies I want to see. Like what? There's one on Netflix. Mm-hmm. Or if you have an idea. Um, I don't really watch a lot of Korean movies. But you're Korean and we have to do one and we've done <laughs> 11 episodes. I know. I know. And I don't, I, I tend to not like Korean movies about music. Like well, it'll the make ones a great that discussion. I've seen, mm-hmm. I've really hated. Then it'll make a great discussion. You know the one, um, Sopyeonje about Pansori? Yeah, I, I really like that movie. Oh man, that movie is disturbing. Like I just yeah, it yeah. is. It's but also really fascinating. It's very fascinating. We could do that. Oh yeah, but it's just so like there are so many things that we would have to explain. Well, that makes yeah. for a podcast, right? Yeah, 
Yeah. Because it's Pansori is such a specific fucking thing. Yeah. It's just so yeah. specific and like a lot of people It's crazy. It's like violent. Hate it. Yeah. <laughs> it's violent. Yeah, you theater. have to like it's like Yeah, and then you have to like go torture yourself and then like, you know, vomit blood. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot to, of hitting yeah. sticks and yeah, things like, like that. <laughs> You have to go in the mountain and like scream and yell until you like vomit blood mm -hmm. so that you can like That's the pathos, man. Tear, That's the tragedy. Tear something in your vocal cords so Why that do you, you think can there's sound so much like mel you have melodrama Han. in in Korean. Oh, what the film. hell, man? That's yeah. so dangerous. Mm -hmm. That's like a great way to just completely injure like just never be able to sing again but yeah. that's what you have to do right. to sing pansori mm -hmm. what kind of a sick culture is that mm -hmm. it's mine <laughs> <laughs> okay well we're, i i think we should do a korean movie for next yeah time. okay and we're not sure which one mm -hmm. we will yeah see you next time for that one any other thoughts on this movie love barbara streisand but not that much you know it's like i don't yeah. need that much of barbara streisand <laughs> it's a lot of streisand it's a lot of barbara streisand yeah <laughs> All right. Um, one thing I do want to mention before mm -hmm. we go. Mm -hmm. This is a personal pitch. Mm -hmm. So I have a book out. Oh, yes. That's coming out. It's it's being released on mm -hmm. January 31st, I think. Oh, I didn't even know that. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it is on Glass Spider Publishing, and it is called... Living in the Age of Survival. Living in an Age of Survival. An Un-Age. An, an Age of Survival. Yeah. Viral Fragments from Trump to COVID. And it's a polit it's a book of political philosophy mm. that I've been writing. It's a period of time from 2016 until this summer, mm. this past summer, talking about the transition in sort of politics and technology and social media and some of the philosophical ideas that I was working through during this time and being isolated and this sort of thing. It's just a th series of thought pieces about mm -hmm. uh, the election of Trump on through to COVID and mm -hmm. some themes that have been that have been troubling me, and also to provide kind of an, uh, a kind of creative ethics from out of that. Mm -hmm. So that's the little right. book I've written. Yes, and it spans from what 2016. Yeah, when Trump came into yeah, office. Yeah, to 2021. Yeah, summer right? of 2021. Yeah, summer of 2021. It's dedicated to my beautiful wife, <laughs> my wonderful wife, who is supportive to me while we were separated. <laughs> so the joke. When you... <laughs> All right, go ahead. Okay, so <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I was supposed to proofread this book and. Just a little bit of background info. I did. I I, I read like about half. of Well, it. let me interrupt yeah. you there. I had you proofread the the book to make sure I wouldn't get canceled on some of the <laughs> yes, things I was writing. Yes, about. and I had read. I you know I read about half of it. And it, to be honest, like this is the most readable thing that you've ever written, and it was Thank actually you. very entertaining. It was an easy read. It wasn't that you know I had a hard time going through it like your Terrence Malick book. I had a hard time going through. That's that's a dense book. A t the Terrence Malick book. But this one, it wasn't that. It's just that I was very busy mm -hmm. and tired at the time. I was doing a lot. Yeah. And, and I was so, nagging you to read it. Yeah. And so we had a huge fight about the fact that like I hadn't proofread this. Yeah. Because you told me you would. Yeah. And then so... And then but I was also... Up. Yeah. But to, to my... I have to I have to say I was like pressing you because I wanted to get it done. Yes, so I was pressing yeah. you and that wasn't Yeah. But anyway, we made up and then I we joked about changing the dedication yeah, to Yeah, cuz the dedication had already been there. Yeah, the dedication said my loving and supportive what is it? S unconditionally s like loving and yeah, I don't. Suit. Something like that. Yeah. For, for her un, for her unwavering or unwavering and unconditional support. And then we were going to change it to sporadic and conditional. Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes supportive wife. Yeah. Occasionally supportive wife. Yes. <laughs> that would be funny if I kept that in there or if I put that in. That'd be cool. But yes, this is a... It's a very easy philosophical read, and I as don't say that lightly. Goes, yeah, right. as far as philosophy goes, it's a very easy read, and it's also a great book to reflect on, like this crazy time that we've this lived. This crazy ass time. This and and then you know there were so many moments when I was like, oh my god, that's right, that mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. That's why I feel like this. Mm -hmm. And so it was actually it it helped a lot to read mm. to read somebody else's thoughts. Mm. 
That's good. Over that period of time. Yeah. So that's available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and Book Depository. We're, we were trying to avoid the Amazon thing because I think Jeff mm-hmm. Bezos is the devil. And we're doing mm-hmm. that in part. If you can buy it on Barnes and Noble or the Book Depository, mm-hmm. I think that's Amazon anyway. But, mm-hmm. you know, look out for it. Yeah. We'll see you next time. We'll see ya. Bye bye. Under the moonlight, I'll sing you a song. So you'd magically feel a lot less alone Hopefully they'll live eternally If we paint ourselves all bright with stories Of heroes and poets and sadness and war Of immeasurable pain on conditional love Movies about music